A warm and sincere welcome to this word for Wednesday, all the way from the Highland capital of Inverness. We are now past the autumn solstice, and hopefully you're enjoying the incredible colours of the season, gold and russet, orange and yellow. We are thankful to have had a good summer and a ripened harvest. Praise be to God. My thanks go to Margaret for her reading of scripture, Willie and Georgie for their prayers, Darren for his accompaniment, and Joanne, as always, for compiling the service. Our call to worship is from Prophet Isaiah 53, verse 6. All of us were like sheep, but were lost. Each of us going his own way, but the Lord made the punishment fall on him, the punishment all of us deserved. So let's all bring the praise and glory to God as we continue in our worship. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we praise you because you are the source of all that is good and true, and you are the source of life itself. We can plan, we can build, and we can make many things, but only you can create. Only you can create out of nothing. Only you can give life to what you have made. Father, we praise you that from the very beginning, it was your intention that we should not only have life, but we should have life, life that is real and full and free. We praise you that in Christ you have shown us the lens to which you were prepared to go, so that we should have new life. We praise you that in him, and through his utter commitment to your purpose and his obedience to your will, you have left off us no doubt as to your love and mercy towards us. We praise that this new life you have for us has no end, it is not limited by time or eternity. Wonderful God, we praise you for that love which will never let us off, never let us down and never let us go until we have entered into that life, which is filled with the power of the Spirit. We praise you now and forever for our life in Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen.
the Bible reading is taken from 1 Peter chapter 2 and at verses 21 to 25. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, they did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Amen. And may God bless to us the reading of his holy word. I have entitled my reflection, Hallelujah, What a Saviour, A Perfect Submission. And Peter, that is Simon Peter, the disciple, explains it well in the verses read by Margaret. Peter is actually speaking to servants and slaves about how to deal with difficult masters. How should they, as followers of Christ, respond to the cruelty of an unjust master? Peter directs them to simply endure according to the example of Jesus. In verse 21, it reads, Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. What do, do we mean by Jesus being a substitute? Well, as we know, there are substitutes for many things in life. Saccharine, a, subject, a substitute for sugar. Soya sausage, substitute for beefy best from Buchanan's perhaps, or another butcher's, you know. And what about all the spreads? which substitute for butter to help, help our cholesterol and waistlines. And so it goes on. In sport, there are always substitutes standing eagerly by, ready if a player is injured or needing a rest. And so the word in itself is easily recognised and understood. However, we can spiritually personalise the word, for we all possess a substitute in the name of Jesus Christ, for he died for each of us, bringing us a peace beyond all our understanding. He took our place. In other words, he was a substitute, the suffering servant for all our wrongdoing. Pretty hard to accept and talk about a serious subject, but one which is fundamental in our faith life. I know you will agree that Jesus' behaviour did not warrant death in the form it took. After all, he was a good man. He healed the sick. He caused the blind to see. He raised the dead and preached the good news to the poor. So we can say wholeheartedly that Jesus is the perfect substitute. God in the flesh, who died for us all, as was God's plan. As I said, in sport we can have substitutes, but there are several things in the realm of our faith life of which there can be no substitutes. Firstly, Although many would like to challenge this, there is no substitute for God. As you will agree, many in the 21st century make wealth and prestige their God or their career or their fancy car or their addiction, but all fail in their pursuit of happiness, for there is absolutely no substitute for God. God created each of us in his own likeness, and he created the world and the heavens above. In Isaiah 46, we read, I am the Lord and there is none else. God is holy, he is righteous, he is pure and merciful, he is powerful and sovereign. We cannot name a substitute. So we see there is no substitution for the first part of the Trinity, nor is there one for God the Son or God the Spirit. Remember Jesus' words, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one goes to the Father except by me. As for the Holy Spirit, the third part of the Trinity, we can never have a substitute. For this is what is living in your heart, this moment, 
if you're a Christian and you have the Holy Spirit with you as you go through life as a comforter and a counsellor and a friend, the one who opens our understanding to God's word. There's also no substitute for prayer, either personal or corporate. It is the power source of God's people, equivalent to the engine room of a ship. Without prayer, we would become faithless and barren Christians, for it is our means of communication with God our Father. As we have already suggested, if you need one thing in life, you can perhaps substitute something else, but nothing, whether it be eloquence, intellect, enthusiasm, smooth talk, etc., we can go on, can be a substitute for prayer. Scientists think if we could harness lightning or tap into the resources of the mighty tides of the ocean as the ebb and flow, we would have power so awesome. However, never as awesome as that of prayer and its power. Remember Jesus' words in Matthew 7, Ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and you shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Furthermore, there is no substitute for the Holy Scriptures, for the Bible is the inspired, infallible work of God and that is why it is given such respect in our churches. Within it are 66 books of immeasurable biblical wisdom. The word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It judges the desires and thoughts of man's heart. Granted, I know there is much in the way of inspirational writing to be found in the glow and it's like but we must never neglect going straight to the source, the word of God. Difficult to understand as it is in many instances. Through reading it, we get to know and bond with God one to one. Additionally, there is no substitute for the church and its people, for the church is its people. Oh yes, there are many buildings where people gather, schools and cinemas, high-rise flats, etc. But the church is a collection of God's beloved. It is a band of Bible believers of Christ, all working in the same direction on a learning curve, and their destination is celestial. Some are further along the path than others in their spiritual journey, but each one is part of the body of God's people, believers, with the main aim of carrying out the Great Commission to proclaim Christ as the Redeemer to others, to claim them as him as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Finally, there is no substitute for God's love, for his love was personified in his son Jesus, and the world began to know love as never before. What do I mean by that? Well, this love came in the form of a baby born in a simple manger and died in the form of an innocent man crucified outside the city walls of Jerusalem. A man who was forsaken by the world, his friends, family, and for a time, it even, it even seemed by his father in heaven. This was love at its deepest. So we see God has set a standard of love and there is no substitute, nor ever can be. This love conquered the world of sin by its power. Love from God remains when all else is removed. And we can see that love is the greatest of the three when we read Corinthians 13. Now abides faith, hope and love. And the greatest of these is love. God's love has stood the test of time into eternity and will never be replaced. No human love can go anywhere near the benchmark of God's love. In closing, and just to underline our central truth, that Christ is our substitute. I recently read this article, which I'm sharing with you. It goes this way. Ernest Gordon was a British soldier captured by the Japanese during World War II and imprisoned in the jungles of Thailand. These soldiers, as you can imagine, endured a living hell, being cruelly treated, tortured, and malnourished by their captors. Ernest writes, one day, a shovel was missing. The Japanese officer in charge became really angry and demanded that the missing shovel be produced 
or they would kill us all. No one budged until finally one man stepped forward and the officer then proceeded to cruelly take his life. At the next tool check, ironically, there was no shovel missing. And the men then realized that there had been a miscount at the first check. The prisoners were stunned. And why? They then realized an innocent man was willing to die to save everyone else. The innocent incident made such a mark on Ernest, the writer of the account, and it made him more deeply recognize the suffering Christ being his substitute. Indeed, what a profound effect this had on all the men, so that after they were liberated, they, instead of taking revenge on their captor, said, no more hatred, no more killing. Now what we need is forgiveness. That is a wonderful example of what substitution means. A prayer in closing. Father, thank you for the gift of salvation and forgiveness we enjoy because of Jesus, our substitute. We thank you for your grace towards us. Thank you for sending a shepherd, a leader, a guardian. Help us to come to grips with the reality that Jesus took the fall for us and that a perfectly innocent man suffered because of our choices, our words, our attitudes, our desires, and our thoughts. Thank you for Jesus, in whose precious name we pray. Amen. Loving God, you care for us and hear all our petitions. We come again to lay before you the concerns we have for these folk that we know and for the situations in your world that cause us sorrow each day. We experience through the media, media the, and internet the conflict areas of war in the Middle East, in Africa, in Asia and Russia. And we feel at times, will there be continued inhumanity to man by man? And our minds and our hearts grown. For you created a world to, to live, for us to live in in peace and yet, because of the choices you gave us, many choose anger, control and greed to dominate their thinking and actions. Lord, we pray that all who govern the world know you and you lead them and the nations in your path, we pray. We ask your guidance and your blessing on them. Lord, we pray for our nation of Scotland, where many folk used to know your son, but now their secular life is flourishing and many not following your purpose or your commission. Loving Lord, we need your help to bring a revival in our nation, we pray. Gracious God, we remember all who are coping with this pandemic. May they be helped by the nations sharing and looking out for their needs, particularly vaccines to be shared, medicines to be shared, and Lord, hospital care to be given to all those in need this day. We thank you for all who enabled vaccination to be discovered, those who make it and those who administer it. They have saved many lives and Lord, we thank you for that. We pray though that they acknowledge you in their recovery. Loving God, we thank you for all the blessings we receive each day. And Lord, in this silence, we, we leave these prayers of healing that you have given to the folk that we have left by name to you. Those who are ill, those who are in hospital at this time, and we think just heard about Laura, Lord, and we just pray for her. We pray that they find the cause of this a illness and the cause of a, to the family and the, the grief that they are, they are experiencing. Lord, be with Catherine, particularly in, in young Catherine and the family, and also be with Adam as he starts in a new part of his life and a new career. Lord, you already know all that we have shared with you and our concerns with you, but you have asked us to bring all to you every day through Jesus, our Saviour. Lord Jesus, accept these prayers silently brought and spoken to you. Amen.
The two hymns we enjoyed this morning so tell the whole story of what our faith is grounded in, Jesus being the perfect substitute and also being our shepherd king. Indeed, we can all echo the words, hallelujah, what a saviour. Enjoy autumn and its array of colour, portraying God's creation, and all keep safe and well in the colder months ahead. I conclude with a short blessing. The blessing of God, the eternal goodwill of God, the shalom of God, the warmth and love of God be among us and between us, now and always. Amen. <laughs>